We now take a look at the book of 2 Peter, and I am on page 987 in your pew Bibles. This is chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Listen now for the word of God. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he's given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine glory and nature. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection and mutual affection with love. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we continue our sermon series on the seven deadly sins, and we're looking at these capital vices through the lens of sanctification. As Christians, we, we really live with an openness to the Holy Spirit wooing us, drawing us in, nudging us, conforming us more and more into the image and character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a part of what it means to follow him. And the more aware we are of our sin and our need for God's forgiveness, the more open we are and the more receptive we'll be to grace. Um, and all of this leads us closer to healing, which is why we're talking about these seven deadly sins. Whether it's vainglory, envy, gluttony, Lust, and Travis, you did a wonderful job last week on such a tough subject. Thank you. We're not doing this as a guilt trip. We're not doing this to lead people to despair. We are talking about these sins so that we might be led to freedom, to be set free. The sermon series is designed as an invitation to discover true freedom in Jesus Christ. Now, when you hear that word freedom, I imagine a lot of things are, are circling throughout your hearts and your minds. In this book, Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville writes, Nothing is more wonderful than the art of being free, but nothing is harder to learn how to use than freedom. We live in the land of the free, but we confuse the true nature of freedom in our hearts and our minds. Our North American culture emphasizes individualism, right? Stressing the needs of the individual over the needs of the group as a whole. So think Ayn Rand in her book, Fountainhead. If you've read it, then you know personal independence reigns supreme. We choose our own path, we do whatever we want, whatever we desire, whenever we desire. And so with her unforgettable, passionate rasp, Janis Joplin crooned, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing. It ain't nothing, honey, if it ain't free. But a closer look at the New Testament Gospels, however, reveals this is not the freedom that um, Jesus promised his followers. Now, when Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah, the anointed, the chosen, he said that he had come to earth to proclaim freedom. And in another area in the, in the Gospels, he's in a synagogue and he says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the Apostle Paul will pick up on this later in Galatians 5 when he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. In other words, Jesus was not setting us free to do whatever we wanted Jesus is setting us free to do what we ought to do, what we should do, what we must do. 
He's liberating us to walk in relationship with God, to be the kind of people that God is creating us to be, with the ability to obey God, to walk in God's will. And this is the freedom that sin had long denied us. Just read Romans chapter 6, verse 7. And I'm reminded of the late theologian Heinrich Borkham, who said that, that in the light of God, our whole life is full of opportunities to bring something of the life of God into the world. And by saying that, he means this is true freedom. A freedom that brings us or brings the best of ourselves, the best of God and who we're becoming to others. And in that way, we become participants of divine nature, which is a mystery and something beautiful altogether. Now, there can be no doubt that sloth is a special case among the seven deadly sins. It's the one vice we pragmatic, hardworking, uh, high-achieving, independent, free Americans aren't really too concerned about. After all, we live with purpose. We are driven. We are free. So we're purpose-driven people. We live by the wisdom of Ben Franklin in his Poor Richard's Almanac, early to bed, early to rise. Author William Willimon in his book, Sinning Like a Christian, rightly points out that on the other hand, the phenomenal growth of state-sponsored gambling suggests that there are many of us who expect to be given a life for nothing, betting on luck rather than hard work to get what we want. The challenge, of course, is to name sloth a sin rather than um, a mere psychological disposition. And so Willimon says, if we think about sloth, which is probably less thought about than the rest of the other seven, uh, six deadly sins, it's not considered by us a sin against God. Listen to this. This is, this is important. Sloth, then, is an offense against time, a sin against our potentiality, a sin against ourselves, a failure to get out there and grab what we deserve. In other words, our failure to become gods unto ourselves. So when you hear the word sloth, what do you think about? What, what, what comes to your, your mind? Most folks probably think about the uh, lazy bones passage that John Norton just read for us. You lazy bones. Ah, but you're lazy. Get up and do something. Or you think about Mike TV in the movie Willy Wonka and the, the Chocolate Factory. You know that annoying, self-absorbed kid will never get off the couch because he's so consumed with watching television all day? Or you think about the college student that never does his laundry. If it doesn't smell that bad, just put it back on. Sloth conjures up all kinds of images in our minds. The sluggish tree dwellers of Central and South America could, that could literally be robbed by snails. The person with no energy who sleeps a lot. Idle hands, the opposite of diligence. Rebecca DeYoung in her book, Glittering Vices, writes this. Since the modern industrial era, diligence and industri industriousness have been pragmatic virtues aimed at profitability and professional success. When careers replace religion as a source of meaning, worth and identity, laziness still carries a significant stigma. Our society measures personal worth in terms of productivity, if efficiency, and the maximization of our potential. So we'd better get busy or we'll be good for nothing. That's right. Go to the ant and consider its ways. And be wise. Consider what? Go to the ant? Are we kidding? 
Did you know that the ant is one of the world's strongest creatures in relation to its size? One ant can take up to 50 times more its own weight. They'll even work together to move bigger objects as a group. They have excellent strategic planning, precision, and organization skills. Ants teach us the necessity of careful planning to look ahead. They store food during times of plenty so that during times of scarcity, they'll still have lots and lots to nibble on. And they also plan for seasons of work and rest to prevent burnout. This is all documented. And by the way, ants really run the world. And we better get used to it. So go to the ant. Go. Go, you lazy bones. Go. But what if I told you sloth is, is more than that lazy, unprepared person? It's true, poverty, crisis will overtake some, same way that an armed person robs an unsuspecting victim. But Scripture does not condemn those who would work if they could, but legitimately are prevented from doing so. And Scripture never, ever, ever says it's a sin to be poor. No, in fact, I know there are people who work diligently every week, and they still struggle to make ends meet. Scripture does say, however, that the slothful person's appetite is never filled. And that she has a huge desire to do what is righteous, but she simply refuses to spring into action to do what she knows she must do. And in this way, a slothful person could care less. A slothful person has no heart. In this way, a slothful person is dead already. Makes sense considering the word sloth has roots in the Latin word acedia, which means without care. It can indicate spiritual laziness and a weariness or a boredom of the soul that leads to despair. Properly understood, sloth is a sin against God's love in that it goes so far as to refuse the joy that comes from God and to be repelled by divine goodness altogether. Here's how Rebecca DeYoung puts it in her book. A person with acedia essentially says, I want God to love me. Oh, yes. But being changed by God's love is way too hard. Mm -mm -mm. No, I, I want the comfort and security of being loved by God without having to give back sacrifice anything, take responsibility, or, or invest myself in the relationship over the long haul. In the end, any thought of spiritual commitment makes someone with acedia feel grieved, oppressed, resentful. So the essence of sloth is captured in a medieval painting by Hieronymus Bosch. You know this name. It shows, um, you probably know the painting, it shows a man dozing in his chair in the middle of the day. He's got a pillow under his head and there's a little, little dog resting by his feet. And, and, and standing next to him is this nun. And the nun is holding out a prayer book and rosary beads. But he's just there, sleeping, dozing off. Not able, not willing to wake from his slumber. He'd rather snooze than hear from God. I'm reminded of the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's troubled to the point of death. Uh, he's facing the greatest test in his life. He asks his disciples to keep watch with him. You, you know the scene. And he asked them to pray, to be with him in this hour of need. Pray. Be alert. So he goes off to pray, 
and he returns, and what does he find? He finds them all sleeping. And he says, couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour, Peter? Seriously? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Twice more he asks them to keep watch with him. Twice more they can't do it. Finally, he says to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Arise. He asked them to care enough to be with him in that moment, but they couldn't or they wouldn't do it. Not only did they miss the opportunity to be with the Lord in his hour of need, but they failed to prepare for their moment of testing. Maybe Peter would have responded differently had he strengthened himself through prayer. These are things I think about. What if he was praying? What would he have said? How many moments with God have we missed because we're too sleepy, we're too busy, we're too distracted, we, we, we have the iPad in front of us and whew, wow, we just spent five hours glued to this device or to our cell phones. How many opportunities to do good have we missed simply because we never got around to it? Sloth really is a sin of omission when you think about it, failing to think or feel or do something right and good. It's, it's not just about falling asleep during your quiet time, and I've done that many times where I've, I've tried to spend time with the Lord, but I just, I nodded off and an hour nap, and it did my soul some good. We've all been there. It's really about making excuses when God prompts you to do something, and you say things like this, you know what, this is not a good time for me. Yeah, that's not my gift. You know what, if I do that, people are going to look at me funny. Now, I'm, I, I can't, I won't, I'm not available now. It's about avoiding conflict when conflict is called for. It's about waiting for some el- someone else to step up to the plate. It's about dreaming of somewhere else when you should be present to those who are right there with you in the moment. It's not necessarily doing anything wrong, but failing to do something good, something that could potentially bring what Heinrich Bornkamm says, the life of God into the world, potentially changing someone else's life and your own in the process. And now we begin to see why sloth is so deadly. It is a deadly sin. Here's what Rebecca DeYoung asks. She says, why why does someone with Acedia resist love. Listen, because a love relationship marks an identity change and a corresponding commitment to daily transformation. Those with acedia object to not being able to stay the way they are. Something's got to die for a new self to be born, an old self to which we are very attached So this vice is the thank you note that never was written, the phone call we still have to make, the neighbor or coworker we still need to invite to church. It's the half-written article, the unfinished project, and the unfulfilled promise to, hey, let's have coffee one of these days. I'll, I'll be in touch with you. So it's easy to diagnose this problem as a lack of discipline, but what it really comes down to, I think, is a lack of devotion, a lack of going inward, a lack of sitting with it, a lack of conducting that spiritual audit on ourselves that reveals what our true motives really are, a lack of taking on the virtues of courageous endurance, long-suffering, perseverance, and attentiveness. Are we in prayer every day? We should be. Are our ears and eyes open to what God might be showing us with our hearts and hands ready for opportunities to serve God? Are they? We can't keep sleepwalking 
through this amazing life that God has given to us. One last illustration, then I'm done, I promise. So the Desert Fathers loved to say that one of the great cures to acedia is manual labor. <laughs> I'm so glad they pointed this out because this is so me. You know, I can study for three hours, but then I'm going to explode if I can't go outside and cut a tree down. I got to get my hands in the dirt. I got to pull out that rake and do something that I can see and be productive. So they say, go out and garden. Do some yard work. Do chores around your house. Work on a hobby project. Do something with your hands. Why? Such work helps us discover that we need not give in to our emotions in front of a task, but that we really can, we really can, with God's grace, gain control over our bodies to offer them to God and worship in all things. And so the key to all this is to be patient, to choose one thing to improve at a time and be gentle with ourselves when failure happens because we are going to fail. Using our freedom to choose the good of the moment, even if it's something we do not want to do, will open our hearts, will open us more to God, will appreciate God more deeply, and we will see goodness, God's goodness in everything, in every action, which is ultimately choosing God. <laughs> When you think of sloth, what do you think about? Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the challenge of your word today. For when we think of sloth, and we think of our own lives, it's easy to think of our many shortcomings and failures. But how wonderful that in Christ we are free, free from sin and death, free to choose to do the good that you would have us do, that we might bring life into the world and to those who are around us. Motivate us, God, in the right ways. Show us where we come up short. Convict our hearts and lead us in the way everlasting. For we offer this prayer to you through Christ our Lord and all God's people say, Amen.